should they should have pushed the panic button and done exactly. something. Right. Yeah. Jean should have pushed the panic button too and agreed to go to Mayo Clinic with me or John Hopkins or someplace else yeah, to get another to get another opinion. But one of Jean's greatest strengths, and everybody who knows her, I think will agree that Jean soldiered on. Absolutely. No matter what, Jean soldiered on. And that was her response to this post-operation situation in which she found herself. She just kept soldiering on. And she had agreed, on December 18th, she agreed that she would go to Mayo uh, after the legislative session. <laughs> <laughs> but then, when I got back from Christmas, when I got to the hospital, she told me that she had she had contacted, she had contacted Mayo to go sooner. And I called them, and she had actually been accepted. But she was accepted based on her being um, not hospitalized. Mm -hmm. And the standard for admission is different if you're hospitalized. And you have to have a, a the hospital has to release you. So that was the problem. Also, she was so physically degenerated by then that we would have had to med back her by plane. But I had somebody who was going to pay for that. I had a feminist from the caucus. We were going to, to pay for that, but we could not. She, she was simply too weak at that point to make the trip. It was, it was too late. And then she coded, uh, and six minutes of CPR to revive her. And she was never really good for that. Not, not consistent. It was a terrible way to die from starvation. Yeah, and I'm sorry that we weren't able to support you. Oh, well, thank you, but you know, there were so many wonderful women that I met from Jean's life in Arlington and what have you that were there at the hospital and in and out and what have you, and, and that was, and, and then Annie Hover, who was a good friend of mine from the caucus, and, and I mean, really, one of the hardest parts of this was that quite literally, I, I spent the night at the hospital, the night that I felt she was slipping away, and that night, Elise was brought into the hospital, but I didn't know it, and Elise died on the floor where I was with Jean. So what, spiritual ones, tell me what's going on here. Mm -hmm. That's what's going on here. Well, I would say that's a, a sign for us to tell our stories. <laughs> because we have targets on our back. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Thank you, Georgia. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> Chilling. Oh, 
But I think I think Charles is still alive. Charles is still alive, but Charles dropped out after Catherine was born. Charles was the father. Charles didn't have the child. Charles was born without any eyes, and that then she was born in 1980, and that sort of irrevocably changed Charles. Susan was, that was sad, that was very sad. Susan died so young. Well, Susan died young, and again, in some ways, so necessary, unnecessarily. If, it, you know, if anybody had been there, uh, but that mm -hmm. happened to be a night when nobody was there, and she had an insulin reaction. And uh, Kathy Wilson died of a massive heart attack at age 54. Davy uh, Anderson, um, whose caucus, Davy, um, husband left her. Her husband, who had agreed that the Smithsonian would take the van, and then he, when he left Davy, then he was big. Um, I didn't know that connection. Oh, yeah. yeah. He was deputy director of the mm -hmm. Smithsonian. So, well, um, you know, I, I think that we did borrow against a lot of things. You know, we borrowed against our health. Borrowed against our careers. Oh, yeah. No question. Uh, I was, um, you know, I. It took me several years to recover my health after the ERA. Um, the reason I wouldn't go do the, the uh, hunger strike with Sonia is because I felt it would kill me. I felt yeah, that, I almost I felt, did it. I felt I, I felt I was that weakened by all of that. But if I did that, it would probably kill me. Could, but we all, you know, we borrowed against a lot of things. You know, I, I don't have uh, the kind of career that a person should have with a PhD. Uh, I have an arrest record. <laughs> I know what that feels like. <laughs> I, you know, but your record got expunged. No, Jean's got expunged, but not yours. Jean and I didn't say this at anything. Jean sought to have her record expunged, and then didn't tell me for a number of years that she'd done that. Oh no, I would never. Never. Well, I, I, well, that would probably be the, I probably go with the more apologize. No. <laughs> uh, I'm not supposed to be proud of it, but I am. I am. Proud. Should be. I think I'm proud that they singled me out yeah. and said, get her, and came thundering down that hall after me. Mm -hmm. I'm also proud of the fact that you, you might, two of my best lines in life came out of that. Mm -hmm. One was when that policeman was after me, and I was trying to thin him off. I, 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 this watch snapped off in my hand. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it again until uh, we were on the edge before we got put in the cop car and he was looking for his watch and I realized it was in my pocket. <laughs> and I, I, I said, oh, lost your watch, too bad. <laughs> this man's lost, lost it. he never could tell time anyway. Uh, but, but that was a good, good line. When we, we get to uh, the jail, we hear a phone call come in saying, Officer Goss has lost his watch and he's wondering if one of those women have it. One of those girls, I think, said it. Girls. Yeah, and of course they had done a, com a complete search of us. And um, they never looked in your pocket. Well, they did. And so they said, well, the skinny one, <laughs> the skinny one has two watches. She had one on her her arm, and then she had a man's watch in her pocket. Well, that's probably his watch, blah, blah. So go back there and get his watch. So you're coming. And I said, did you, we're, this, we're going to go down. I'm going to go out history with a petty thief. That's what's going <laughs> to happen here. And so. Uh, so he, he, we had tried to figure out if we could hide it in the squad car before we went into jail. So I was really worried about his watch. Anyway, in he comes, this man and says, you, you have Officer A.C. God's watch. Surrender the watch. And I said, you mean this watch? And he said, yes. And I said, what was that name? What, what was that name you said? And he said, Officer A.C. God. I said, I, thank you. I have to write that down. And I said, I can't give you this watch without a receipt. I'm behind bars. <laughs> I cannot give you this watch that I received because this is the only way I have of identifying a man who assaulted me. Uh -huh. And they gave me a receipt. Which <laughs> <laughs> I have to this day. And we, in, in the trial, we waited and waited for them to bring this up that I stole this man's watch. They never did. Because <laughs> I don't think they would look because I was prepared to produce the receipt. That's how they, they never I took a slideshow of the pictures down to a Virginia now legislative meeting in Richmond, and it was projected on the wall of our meeting space. And of all the things that I had pictures 
of things that uh, talk about ephemera, things that people most related to were Mary Ann Bell's bail receipts and plastic handcuffs. <laughs> sure, that's because that's very tangible. Mm -hmm. Very tangible. And that part of our everyday existence. Uh, you know, one of the things that was lovely was that Lenny uh, wrote some poetry in the middle of that period. And she, is, some of it is the funniest poetry I've ever read. And she talks about not being the one that danced on the table in the cell <laughs> with the other rowdy women and so on. And it was just, there are just a series of her poems that kind of memorialize this poor time. She's in Arizona. And she's been writing poetry. Yeah. She has had four books of poetry published and won several awards. And what's the history of two of Jamestown? Yeah. Two of the Lenny stories. I want the Lenny uh, pictures of her reading in Marionette Mills. Uh, let's find out what Simone would like us to do before oh. we go into Lenny stories. I think, well, can we have maybe Lenny stories after a break? Because I have the book of poems that you gave me, and some of hers are, are in there, so we could maybe read one of those when we come back and start there. Um, I'd like also to have a moment at some point this evening to hear from Ray. Yeah. Um, who did a lot of work, <laughs> um, but who's, you know, who's a good ally, right? So I'd like hear, to hear someone to talk about us from the, from the male point of view. Needs to be honored too, um, but yeah, we can have we can have some of the stories that have their names here. Oh, oh, so, so we go yeah. down. Let's just have a little break. Yeah, we eat dinner and food okay. breaks. Food from, from, from the food good. I don't know if they're from the, the series. No, this this was I think this published in eighty one or eighty two. Yeah, and where is that still in Wisconsin? Eighty five. I remember seeing that letter reminds me of the time we were on Seminary Road by the seminary oh, and we're the practicing, practice, going, the practice, practicing yeah. going over the fence. We had to go look for fences that were wrought iron fences that were like. It's the same fence like, as the White House. Right? It's the same fence as the White House. We found two That's fences that were identical. <laughs> One was at the cemetery in Georgetown. Well, not identical. Well, close the enough. Close to enough. Enough. Right height. I brought my measuring tape. <laughs> because we wanted to be sure that the ladder would work uh -huh. and that nothing would happen. It worked like a charm. It was wonderful. And what was so neat was the people were walking by us as we were there on Seminary <laughs> Road, just as we were. And they would say, well, what are you doing? And we said, well, we're practicing for an event. <laughs> which was at the White House did, was they would sidle up to the fence and measure it with their body parts. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we, we did plan very well, you know. As and a we result, practiced. we knew the dimensions. The fence at the White House is not as high as it looks because it's on a stone wall. Mm -hmm. And you can stand on the wall and, and, and go over the fence. But what it has, at the top is a bar, and then the spikes come up from it. And having measured that, what we did, because we tried different kinds of ladders, is that this is the part that actually would go over the spikes, the spikes mm -hmm. and rest on either side of that bar, and we had these plastic tubes to stabilize it. Uh, these were closet so the things poles. would not slip. And, no and a sisal rope. And once you got it over there right, it wasn't going to slip because it was anchored onto the bar by these two things. And we had the long side to go up. And the short side. And you can grab a hold of the spikes and actually use that as leverage to swing your leg over 
and turn around and then go down the other side. Mm -hmm. And those of us that were the helpers, because uh -huh. she was one of the fence climbers, and we would, were practicing how to get it absolutely over right. the fence in about 10 seconds so that it would be safe for our climber mm -hmm. to go over. And the, 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 the <laughs> like climbers stage. that were taller, a lot of them carried their own ladder, like in a backpack or something. But I'm not that tall. And my friend, uh, Teresa uh, Bergen from New York, I think it is, is a rather big boned Italian woman. It was relatively cold that day, not as cold as it had been. And she had a full length coat. And she took the ladder and she put it under her coat and walked around looking very pregnant. <laughs> and other people would hide their ladders in, in different ways. And that at a specific time, our peacekeepers would form a semicircle around us. So our, our lives always depended on the peacekeepers. And, and the legal observers were there also in right. that circle. But, but they would make sure that nobody, friend or foe, pushed in on us so that we had a clear field. And then Teresa unbuttoned her coat, delivered this ladder, you know, and threw it over uh, the fence, and it got tangled up on this side. And she kept saying, "I got to untangle it. I got to. I'm jumping up on the on the uh, stone wall." She says, "Wait, wait, wait! It's it's tangled." But you know, at that point, I was not going to stop. And I have no recollection of going over, really. Uh, I have a recollection of starting to go up. I have a recollection of landing on the other side and wondering where the police were. But I have no recollection of going over. Now, Sonia Johnson, who didn't practice with us that much because she had to get home for Noli's birthday party, that's her son, when she put her leg over the spikes, she ripped her pants. All the way up. So, She's holding the petition, and she's walking up the White House, slowing, flapping in the breeze. And when we got into the to the jails and were sitting on these cold metal benches, her arthritis was really beginning to bother her. Well, we had a warm snap that day after terribly, terribly cold weather, and I was overdressed, fortunately. So I took off my outer pants and then took off my underwear and gave her my long underwear to wear so that she could stay warm and, and her uh, uh, artist didn't bother her so much. Oh, um, and then it was part of, part of the police understanding when they put us in a holding area behind the White, uh, by the White House with a hill uh, and sort of kept us secreted there. They didn't want us to take us out because that would have given the press another chance to take our pictures. So they were holding us there. And there was this one officer uh, who was really, really grumpy. Uh, and the others were, you know, and, and some of them knew us. And it was almost like, you know, two pickup football teams, you know, after a game. And you sit around and have a beer and talk about the game, except. There was no beer, and we were in handcuffs. And, and, you know, we said to these guys, come on, you knew we were going up that fence, didn't you? You really knew that. Oh, no, you ladies really fooled us. We thought you were going to chain the gate shut. That's how I found out 